Hi, I'm Ed Scar, and today is Monday. And that's a lie, today is actually Tuesday, but because this is YouTube, I can say whatever day I like, and you can believe me unless I tell you otherwise. Anyway, I have a little challenge that I'm setting for myself for this week, and that is to paint a model every single day. So let's get it stuck into the first model for this week, and I'll kind of explain the uh, challenge that I'm setting for myself as we go. So the challenge is, as the title of the video might suggest, to paint a model every single day. And that seems kind of obvious and simplistic, but there's a few nuances that I hope I'll be able to bring out. As with any practice or training, you really have to treat it as practice or training and be deliberate about what you're learning and how you're learning if you're really going to get the best out of that situation. But you also need to be mindful of the pitfalls and bad habits that you could learn because of the way that you're practicing. And in the case of forcing yourself to paint a model every day, there's a pitfall that I think I might fall into, and so I want to make sure I'm aware of it in advance. By forcing myself to paint a model every day, I could fall into the habit of speed painting. Now, speed painting is a valid technique, however, I have no interest in it whatsoever. So what aspects do I want to learn? Well, one thing I've noticed in myself is an apprehension to starting a particular model or deciding what model I want to paint. I look at my shelf of unpainted models and there are so many of them and there are so many that I have interest in and some that I don't have interest in that I sort of just stand there staring at it and go off and have a glass of water instead. And I can have that bad habit of not painting through indecision. So by forcing myself to paint a model every day, I'm forcing myself to pick up something, anything, doesn't matter if it's something that I really, really want to paint and I've had plans for for a long time, or whether it's a model that I am kind of uninterested in and I just want to get it out of the way. But by picking up and painting it every day, I can kind of trick myself into maybe looking at that shelf and more readily picking up a model and thinking, yep, this is the one for today. I'll just get stuck in and go for it. Another thing is organization. How long does it take to set up your equipment? And for me, that includes camera and lights as well. Because if it takes you 20 minutes to pull out all of the, your, your brushes from here, your paints from here, like where did I put my wet palette? Oh, it's up on a shelf here. Gathering it all together and setting up painting, the longer that takes, the less time you have to paint each day. Another thing to learn is finishing a model. Now I'm allowing myself to put down a model at the end of any given day and say, this is not done and I'll revisit it some other time, but I'm not gonna pick it up during the rest of the week and finish it. Whatever I put down at the end of that day, that's it, that's that model done for this week. And so that should give me an impetus to finish each model rather than staring at it and trying to decide what, what color here, what color there, I don't know about these highlights, I don't know about these shadows, what technique to use. Rather than that, I'm on a time scale. I've got to get this done today. And so by having that in mind, I can put that into my subconscious as an aspect of painting. However, by keeping it in my mind that I can just put down a model, it's done for today and I'll revisit it next week or whenever, that also means that those big projects that you can't finish in one session or one day don't get rushed through so that in the future I can pace myself better so that I can get the results I'm after in a reasonable amount of time and most importantly with a minimal amount of stress. And that starts today with my first model of the week, a Retributor's Sister Superior from Games Workshop's Sister of Battle line. And this box was actually given to me as a gift by Ratman. So thank you very much, Ratman, for supplying the box. I'm going to have quite a bit of fun painting these models. You may have noticed that the first few layers of dark green went on very thin and watery. And so what I did was paint it on one layer of green and let it sit and dry. And then I would paint another layer of green. And that wasted a lot of time. It's very inefficient. So what I should have done was painted on one layer of green and then painted one layer of some other color on the model. And I did claw onto this about halfway through painting this model, 
So you'll notice that the green has some wet blended highlights in it before I paint anything else. But then after I've painted some of the other bits, I've gone back and added in the edge highlighting later. Now, of course, if you're batch painting, this may be less of an issue, but it's still something to keep in mind. One last thing of interest for this model particularly is, why did I choose green for the armor? None of the main orders of the Sisters of Battle use green armor. But that's okay because I am painting this as a minor order, a custom order that I'm still working out the details of. So just finishing up, I've painted all of the details gold. And in the book as well, I took this off camera because it's easier for me to reach. But I painted in the text on the book as well. You may have noticed that this character doesn't have a head yet. Well, let's fix that. And I chose one of the heads with the gas mask just because it's cool. And sometimes you have to go with what's cool. Glued it to an off cut of sprue so that I could hold on to it because it's far too small for the painting handle. And with the head done, that's the whole model complete. So here at the end of day one, I think I've done fairly well. It's not perfect, but it's still pretty good. I would say this is probably on the upper end of my skill level because I have spent quite a few hours painting this, taking my time and doing everything just right. And of course I just had to do all of the edge highlighting in all of the lands. But there is one small problem occurring with the resin in the base. Now there's a, a gap in the base as I made it and I decided pretty early on that I was going to fill up the pool of resin, make it look like a little pool of water. Unfortunately what I didn't count for is the surface tension of the resin drawing it up across most of the base and almost up her foot as well. Well certainly she's never coming off of this base, that is um, pretty much permanent now. I suspect that that was exasperated by my use of a matte varnish, because I didn't want the matte spray to dull the water surface, the, the resin, so that went on before the resin went on. However that seems to have done something spoofy with the resin, because this same resin, I have used it before, and it's never wicked quite as strongly as this before. Anyway, let's see what I've got ready for day two. I've got some other videos I need to record today so I can't spend too long on the model that I will paint. So, at the risk of making this a speed paint, I have to limit the amount of time I'm putting on it. So, to make it as easy as possible, I'm going to just paint a simple model. And for day two, which is definitely a Tuesday, I have a second edition Monopose Gretchen. This sculpt is one of those classic sculpts that ends up getting thrown around all over the place. Uh, it's pretty easy to find this particular model on eBay in rather large numbers if you really want it. And it's a sculpt I've painted before, and so painting it again is going to be relatively easy particularly as I'm not putting a lot of effort into doing highlights and stuff. I'll do some highlights, of course, uh, but I'm not going crazy on this. The difficulty with this particular model, if you notice at the beginning, it was completely green because it was spray painted green. Now, I, as I said, these are readily available on eBay and I'm pretty sure that this came with other things or it was in a bundle or maybe I traded for it at some point. I don't really remember where, exactly where it came from. But the previous owner had sprayed a couple of the models with some green spray paint, which seems to make sense for Orcs, you get a good head start on the skin. However, this green seems to be quite glossy, and trying to paint acrylic paints over the top of a gloss spray paint is, uh, it doesn't go very well. And so I ended up having to put quite a few layers on pretty much every part of the model. And if I'm putting multiple layers on, I may as well do a little bit of wet blending and put some highlights in anyway. Interestingly, while the gloss paint gave me some difficulty with getting layers down, it actually proved to be a very interesting thing for the skin. As I mentioned in day one, my dark green paint is horrifically watered down. So when I painted that over the glossy primer, it behaved very similarly to a wash and that looked kind of good enough for me to leave it as it was. I probably should have brought in another layer of, of lighter green on there to really reinforce that, but it looks passable for a line infantry model. And so that's day two complete, a very simple and very quick paint job. While I said that I wasn't gonna do a speed paint, this uh, just took half an hour to do. 
It still looks perfectly serviceable. It's it's not the top end of my skill, certainly, but in comparison to my other Gretchen that I painted um, 15 years ago or something like that, yeah, this is this looks quite a bit better. So that's day two. Let's see what day three has to offer. Another day, another model. And today we have a little bit of a fun one. This is a 3D printed version of Brent from Goobertown Hobbies. However, it's still usable as a generic model, so I'll paint it up as such. And I've made a little modification and we can have a closer look when we do the top down view, which is now. Now I could easily talk for an entire video just about this one model, but I'm going to have to keep it fairly short as I have more to get to. I will make specific mention of the modification that I made and to why I had to make that modification. Now I'm still new to SLA printing and things like supports and stuff and while I understand it from a mechanical point of view, getting the specific sizes and all of that correct is it's not something I've perfectly dialed in yet. And so when I got this model, which has a pre-supported version, I thought I'd try it out. And what I found is that most of the supports break away perfectly and leave a really nice finished pint, and that's good, and that's something I want to learn. But on his arm, which in the orientation of the print was mostly flat, all of the supports there failed, and so it left him amputated at the wrist. And so I went through my bits box, I found a spare hand, and I found a hat. And that's the one thing this model was missing, running away, saving his cats, but also having a feathered cap. That's an important thing as well. Don't want to leave that behind when he's running for his life. Otherwise, I took my learnings from day one and went round the model, filling in the base coats and a simple highlight for each section, and then painting another section while that first section dried. The white shirt taking the most layers of all because white is notoriously translucent. I threw on a wash halfway through and then went back to pick out more of the highlights, particularly again on the white shirt. One thing that almost certainly won't come out on this view is when I painted the broken plate on the floor. And this didn't print out nearly as voluminous as I thought it was on the digital version, but there's certainly the impression of a broken plate on the base, so I painted that in mostly white, but then I came back with a blue to do this old fashioned blue detailing that you get on that cheap mass-produced uh, like fake china plates which is traditional for a pub so makes sense for this model and just going around cleaning up a lot of the smaller details adding some stripes and spots to the cats and taking my time to try and keep it clean so there we go the end of day three and we have little brent done and a reminder as to why i despise super glue it is absolutely terrible and doesn't glue anything ever. <sighs> you may notice in some of the close-up shots here that what appears to be layer lines. However, these don't run in the right orientation to be your layer lines. Rather, these lines are the artifacts of the pixels. They are the grid of the pixels in the screen. And I'll probably do a video on this particular subject, because while this is probably fine for the average line model, I want to be painting to a higher standard. I want to kind of push myself into display painting. Alright, day um, whatever it is, and I have something a little bit interesting. This is not a model made for painting, but actually a toy. And we'll get into why while I paint it. So this is a model of Madame Vastra from the Doctor Who TV series. And it really was a toy that came on the front of a magazine. So even by toy standards, this is on the cheaper end. And because of that, there are actually two reasons why I'm going to have to paint this model in a very different way to how I usually do. Now to give myself a good base, I'm going to start by wet blending the skirts and the tunic. And this is probably the best example of wet blending I've ever been able to capture on film. Partly that's because I'm bad at filmmaking, and partly that's because I record with a phone. But while you're watching the wet blending go down, I'll point out the reasons why this model being what it is means I have to paint it so differently. Firstly, it's because it's quite a bit larger 
than the standard 32mm models that I usually paint. This is actually a 54mm model. I'm not sure if that's by design or if it's just a lucky accident that it happens to be one of the common model scales. But in this case, because the model is larger, I have to paint proportionally smaller details. And so I have to think about things like the texture of the fabric, and not just the highlights on the big volumes, but actually highlighting smaller volumes as well. The other related part of that is because it's a toy, is it actually doesn't have very many sculpted details. So to set myself up for this, I found some reference photos of Madame Vastra. And one of the sets of clothes that she wears has purple top with uh, black lace on it. And I wanted to copy that because that's something that I could paint in. There's certainly none of it sculpted into the model, so I have to freehand it all on. But if I'm going to be painting this black lace over the top, I need to highlight the purple underneath much brighter than I would if I wasn't going to be putting the black over the top. The black's going to make it look darker, so the purple has to look brighter to make it match. Painting in this pattern was surprisingly easy. I did pay specific attention to how thin my paint was and how well it was flowing from the brush, because that sort of thing is important when you're freehanding. And particularly as what I'm freehanding here is just simple lines. I'm not freehanding a full volume that I can then highlight and, and reference things inside of. And so each line has to be spot on. But also, I don't want to mess up and have to redo the purple, particularly as I've spent so much of today doing and redoing the purple of the top to make sure each part matched. If I make a mistake somewhere with the black and have to go over with some purple and fix that, it's going to look different. Unless I do the whole section again, which I really want to avoid. Once I was somewhat happy with the lace on the top, I went on to do some other detail work on the scabbards for the swords. And this is where I started to realise that I hadn't fully prepared myself for this style of painting. I very rarely paint models of this scale, and so I have very little practice in it. And while I know at a surface level some of the important details of it, actually understanding it by having the experience is something else. So I tried to paint in some red strapping for the handle and some gold on the scabbards that I could imply were part of some fabric wrapping, although it was very difficult to make that neat. And in both cases, I went over it again with a black to really straighten out the lines and sharpen up the corners to make it look appropriate. What that also did is it gave me the opportunity to paint over some of the red in particular to make it look like some of the straps were going over the top of some of the other straps. But it was exceptionally difficult for me to then paint in any kind of highlight on the red or on the gold, or for me to put little stripes to maybe suggest that, that it is made of fabric. And this is something I'm going to have to revisit again, larger scale models where you do have to paint in the fine detail like this. So I don't want to say that I'm unhappy with this one, but I'm sort of unhappy with this one. I thought I had a better understanding of what would be required for this very low detail model to actually paint in the detail, to paint in the texture. I thought I had a better understanding of that. However, I have put in quite a bit of texture. There is some there, but maybe not as much as I thought I could achieve. But this challenge is a model every day, and so I have to leave it. I might come back to this model, or at least this style of painting, because it is something that I think I can do better at. But we must march on into day five. So yesterday I made the mistake of painting a model in a style that I wasn't really familiar with, hadn't practiced, and only really basically understood how to do it on a very fundamental level. So today, I'm going to paint a model in a style that I'm not familiar with, have not practiced, and only really understand on a basic, oh, for crying out loud. So my idea for this model is to paint it with an object source lighting style, or an OSL, which just means that you paint your highlights based on a light source that's inside the model, whereas you would usually paint your highlights uh, based on sunlight or some out of the model source of light. In this case, I have this control panel looking thing. And so I'm gonna try and paint this model 
as if he's being lit from the screen. And I'm going to try to paint this OSL to an extreme and actually not paint the back of the model at all and leave it with the black primer layer showing. As if this character is standing in a street at night time or perhaps inside a factory somewhere where, there are no, where there's no lighting. So my first step was to really frame out where I was going to paint. I have a black paint that's kind of a charcoal-y black rather than a pitch black. So I was able to use that and paint around the kind of edge of where I would be painting. And then with each color area, I could wet blend from that charcoal black up into a dark version of that particular color. Now, none of this has come out particularly clearly on video, so I'm gonna skip ahead to where I started putting the highlights in. And here I'm wet blending from the color I've chosen for that particular area up into white. Now, usually I wouldn't highlight up into white because if you highlight up into white, it desaturates out the color that you're working with. However, in this case, I want to desaturate the color. I want it to have this very washed out bright look. And I brought in a much stronger highlight at the closest point on the model to the screen, which is on the chest. I did bring in some highlights elsewhere in the model and particularly even down almost to the knees, but I didn't bring anywhere near as much white there as I did on the chest. I do think I missed out one trick here, and that's partly because of a paradigm that I'm stuck into with the way that I usually highlight. So usually I'll highlight cloth based on the folds and not necessarily on the direction of light. So if you notice on the shirt and jacket on the chest, because of where the screen is, all of this area should be completely washed out and bright. However, because of how I'm used to painting highlights, I'm only painting the raised section of each of the folds in the clothes. So what I'm taking away from this model, what I'm learning from this model, is that I need to be more directional about my highlights rather than basing it on the almost topography of the surface of the model. Now that is surprisingly good. I think I've captured the effect fairly well, and I'm pretty happy with how that's turned out. This is definitely a technique I want to come back to at some point. Um, doing an OSL into just pitch black on the outside. I've not seen that done before, but I'm sure it's been done before. Um, the layer lines of the print, because this is a 3D printed model, um, the layer lines at, at the transition point where it goes into black, make it look like he's almost being eaten by grey goo, um, nano machine sort of thing, which is very cyberpunk indeed. However, this is a success. Today is done. Let's see what tomorrow brings. Day, who knows? Um, I haven't actually picked a model for today, so let's go over to the shelf and have a look. So I've got some 3D printed stuff. Got the Blackstone Fortress set. Ah, one of the Wreck Age Stalkers. That's a nice one. Got some Frostgrave stuff at the back. This is a Knoll. Tanith Trooper with a Flamer. That's good. An old Eldar Skimmer would be fun. Some more Gretchen, some Orcs. Dwarfs. Mm. No, I think the Stalker's calling to me today. So I started this model by painting the big duster coat brown, which was absolutely a mistake and I felt like I painted myself into a corner. Or more specifically, I painted myself into the middle of the color wheel. I have and have had for a while the bad habit of using brown as a filler color almost. I'll paint the main colors of a model and then when it comes to things like belts and pouches, I never really have anywhere to go other than brown. And I almost default to painting belts and pouches and slings as leather or hide and just painting them brown. And so for this model, when I've painted the largest and most distinct feature of the model, that big duster coat, as the color I usually default to when I finished everything else, well, I sort of was mentally stuck into where I should go with the other colors. And while I technically know the color wheel, I don't have as much experience as some of the other painters out there. Which I feel is somewhat of a shame for this model in particular. This model is a homestead stalker from the Wreckage RPG. 
I picked up a bundle of these models a while back and I've been every now and again I'll pick one up to paint and they are really lovely it's something about the sculpt or the material that um, that means that a brush flows across the surface just in such a nice way and I can't really explain it but but painting these models has always felt smooth I am sort of done with this but it's certainly not finished I am running out of time today and I very much run out of inspiration for this particular model it's a lovely model good sculpt and it takes paint really nicely but I just can't decide on the colors you can't necessarily always jump into a model and just have it always work having an idea having inspiration for the specific model can help and I've also proved this week that you certainly don't need inspiration Sometimes you can just start throwing paint at a model, but sometimes it helps. So we'll call this one done for now, and day six, and we'll move on to the final day, and we'll see what I have tomorrow. There's no video for day seven, because I was having a very bad day. And something that everyone needs to learn is that it can be okay to not be okay sometimes. Mental health can affect your work, your school, your hobby time, and your interactions with friends and family. And it's important to look after yourself. And sometimes that means stepping back from a project and not doing anything. Sometimes it can mean pushing hard on a project and really focusing on it. And sometimes, like my day seven here, you can do something small just to keep going, but finding the balance between activity and rest is something that you're gonna have to work out for yourself. Unfortunately, there's no easy formula for that. And so for my day seven, I chose the simplest and easiest model to paint that I could find on my shelf, which is this FDM printed twig blight. I painted it dark brown, I dry brushed it light brown and yellow, and then I gave it a dark wash and that was it. And so after my seven days of painting a model every day, I have my nine models here. Wait, nine? Does that mean we get a bonus round? So what we learned from the bonus round is that sometimes when you start painting, you just don't want to stop. So even after I finished the model for the day, sometimes I just added a little bit of extra and I, over the week, I got these two done. The first is a servo skull made from the Sisters of Battle Cherubim. And the second is a 3D printed Grimdark Goose, which is a wonderful crossing of the memes, particularly as I painted the pauldron um, back armor with the Hawk Lords symbol, except that I painted the head to be a goose head, so this is now a goose lord. And so at the end of the week, I have the nine models that I have painted. This has been an interesting experience, and even the ones that you think I may not have enjoyed, still I did, because I like painting. This is, for me, fun. Now I realise that one of the reasons why I can do this is because of lockdown and spending so much time at home and not everyone has that um, luxury if you can call it that, but rather we make do with what we have and so I did. If you want to recreate some variant of this challenge you don't necessarily have to paint an entire model every day, you can paint one model over the course of a week and just split it into seven or any other number of sections and just paint each section each day. Or you could do all of the base coating on one day. You could do some highlighting the next day. You could do some minor details the third day. There are different ways of kind of achieving the same effect. And actually importantly, time management is an important thing you can learn from this type of exercise. And while I have deliberately used this as a learning exercise, I've gone in every day thinking about how things have gone and what can I take away from that? What can I learn from it? You don't necessarily have to pretend to be at school. You can just enjoy doing a bit of painting every day. And so if you have any comments on how I've painted these, or if you have any suggestions for a different variant of the challenge, or even if you're planning to do it yourself, post a comment in the comment section. And all that malarkey, I am Edgar. I always will be, and thank you very much for watching.